Good evening and welcome to The Right Side, the show where we talk about today's news, views, and trends from an admittedly conservative perspective. I'm your host, Chris Pereja, and this evening we're joined by James Lilex. He's a conservative writer, but has been famous for being in all sorts of media. He's a voice you might recognize from The Hugh Hewitt Show. He's written as a columnist and is into all sorts of things, TV to writing. James, thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you, Chris. A pleasure. So. How did you end up going into the field of all things media, specifically writing these things? And when did you find out you were conservative? Well, two interesting, interesting questions. The first one, how did I start writing? I started, like uh, most people, for, uh, for very altruistic reasons. I wanted to win the girl and crush a rival. <laughs> Essentially, in college, a friend of mine had written a piece for the college paper, and I could do better than that. And I could impress the girl who was looking at him and saying, he's funny. So I wrote a piece, and uh, they bought it. $40, which I spent several times over on dinner for her. She dumped me after a week or so after that, but I kept writing in the hopes that something would come of it, and kept writing and writing and writing, and all through college I thought, well, maybe I'll be an architect. No, nah, maybe I'll write about architecture. Uh, maybe I'll be a teacher. Maybe I'll write about teaching. Eventually I realized that writing is what I wanted to do, and I pursued everything that I had towards writing as much as possible. And naturally, when I got out of college with that English degree, I was a uh, convenience store bag boy for about six months or so. But then got my, my, my fingers into publishing a TV guide and worked my way up the ladder until now. I'm at the Minneapolis Star Tribune newspaper as a columnist and I write for National Review. Now as to the uh, conservative thing, in college, like all people who wanted the best for the world, and I was a good person myself, so I was a very liberal collegian. Back then in the 80s, liberal meant something different, though. You could be pro-defense, pro-America, anti-communist, and still be a liberal. It's changed a bit these days. And later on, um, I found that I was falling away from the things that the party seemed to be saying. And it seemed to be more, um, less of a home for somebody who was anti-communist, for example. And then I had just this epiphany. I was working at a radio station, and uh, the producer slid across a cassette, and he said, we're thinking of playing this guy. Give it a listen. Like this was some secret stuff. And I put it in the cassette player and I drove home. And my ears are bleeding. My hair is plastered back. My cheeks are rippling with G-force. I'd never heard anything like this. Nobody else had. And it was this fellow named, um, uh, sh oh, shoot, shoot. Uh, Rush Limbaugh. Okay. So we started to, to run Rush. And I'm listening like this with my left ear. And then eventually I'm starting to listen with my right ear a little bit more and saying, well, he's a bit extreme, but he's got a point. Well, he's a bit out there, but he's got a point. And eventually, you know, he's got a point. Then I transitioned to somebody who had a house, a job, a wife. And curiously, I began to realize that the state might not have a claim to 50% of my property and that maybe there might be something to be said for a little less interference in government in my life. So I had this light go on while I was mowing the lawn one day and listening to the radio about a, uh, a proposed exhibition of Robert Mapplethorpe's work. Now, you may, not, you may remember the Mapplethorpe. Oh, this is a big thing in about 89, 90. He was a photographer known for beautiful pictures of foliage, of trees, of roses, but also some really, really naughty stuff, really adult stuff. And so they were going to have an exhibition at some Ohio museum, and they insisted that the public pay. And the people who were opposed to the naughtiness of this work said, no, you oughtn't. No, 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 no. They can pay for that themselves. And I realized 10 years ago, I would have thought, if the state doesn't pay for the exhibition of a photograph of a man with a bullwhip in a place where it shouldn't be, that's oppression. <laughs> and now I'm looking at it and saying, there's no reason whatsoever the state has to pay for this. And there's no reason that people should be forced to do so. So on something that trivial, a, a switch flipped. And I threw myself over to the dark side. Well, I had gotten a job before then um, to go to Washington, D.C. and become a political columnist. And when I got the job offer, I was a liberal. And by the time I went out to D.C., I was not. <laughs> and to the credit of my editor, Deborah Howell, who ended up at the Washington Post and elsewhere, uh, she said, I don't care, just as long as you write what you believe and as long as it's good, uh, which are two different things. And so I began to be that rarest of thing, a conservative in Washington in the media, which really really makes a fellow feel alone. 
But why the switch? You said you started out liberal, but it was mm -hmm. more of a classical liberal right. as opposed to yes. today's term. Mm -hmm. How did that walk go? What happened that made you more conservative than you had previously realized yourself to be? As a lot of people find out, I think they find that they don't change, but what becomes the predominant defining aspect of liberalism at the time change. I mean, Ronald Reagan famously said, I didn't leave the party, the party left me. And I sort of felt the same thing 30 years later, which meant the party was constantly losing a lot of people by moving to something else. And in my case, it was, in the 80s, it was possible, as I said, to be a liberal and anti-communist, to regard the Soviet Union as indeed the evil empire, as a, as, a, as a focus for malevolence around the world, and to see them what they were. I also had a lot of Ukrainian friends, and believe me, if you want a good schooling on the Soviet Union, hang around with some ukes from time yes. to time. So w when it became apparent that all of a sudden that this was just crazy talk and we were cold warriors and we wanted to blow up the world and nuclear winter would, would kill the planet and the rest of us, it's like, no, no, actually we do have a substantial, aggressive, ideologically motivated foe here we ought to be working about. And as that be position became less and less tenable in the liberal communities where I was and became more concentrated on the things that now seem to, to, to obsess the left, the identity politics and the rest, I just no longer had that same personal resonance with it. Plus, as I mentioned before, you know, the issues of tax and you know, property and the rest of it, all those selfish things that we're always being convinced about. Once you pull one thread away from your belief in the goodness of government and the, 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 uh, the, the wisdom of the state, once you start to question that on something as small as artistic uh, um, subsidies, you find that that theory is applicable elsewhere and you start to question an awful lot of what you believed. So you started thinking for yourself more and more. No, no, I started taking my messages from the radio. <laughs> Rush specifically. Yes, and of course the ones that were beamed into my head when I took off the tin fail. Yeah, I'd like to think that I started thinking for myself. Right. I was just older with a little bit more experience and I found that the ideas in college did not necessarily um, survive contact with the real world. And that's where a lot of people do lose that kind of liberal feel. The, the current liberal ideology, mm -hmm. they start to realize, hey, wait a minute, Life is more complicated than this. Facebook memes, for example, claiming $1.3 billion divided by yes. 400, by 300 million people is 4.33 million when it's really $4.33. Right. Nice math, not. No, it's enumeracy and not exactly a testament to Common Core in our public schools. Uh, no. But right, no, I mean, <clears throat> as the old expression has it, a man who, a young man who is not a liberal as a young person has no heart. Right. And if he is not a conservative as an older person, he has no job. I'm sorry, head. Brain. Head, 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 I believe brain, it's brain. brain. <laughs> <laughs> so of all the different outlets that you have access to, which one is the most fun for you right now? They're all fun for different reasons. <clears throat> the web is fun because on my site, lilix.com, L-I-L-E-K-S.com, um, I can do anything. It's a train set. It's like having an enormous train set in your basement that everybody can come and see. So absolutely everything that I'm interested in, I can pretend that other people are as well. And I can display whatever elements of pop culture or history or science, or whatever is interesting. It's this enormous, massive site that sometimes I feel like my jobs just subsidize my time on that. My wife certainly thinks that's the case. Uh, so the internet is great for that because it's open-ended and there's no shortage of a news hole. In newspapers, you're always in a straitjacket of sorts. You've got 750 words, you've got 800, and you have to get out, you've got to say it in there. Which is good because it con concentrates the mind and makes you clarify your thought. In radio, again, same thing. You've got to shut up by a certain point and make your point. In print, um, with a newspaper where I work, I can write about anything that I want, and it's, a, it's an incredible freedom to do that. And I'm the luckiest man in the world because they trust me to write about anything. And then in novels, you can just make stuff up and tell stories. And I've written a series of novels about Minneapolis media that has allowed me to just uh, explore different eras of, our, uh, of, uh, of my city's culture and past. So everything has its own different opportunity. There's so, only one thing that I'm missing, though, and that's the one thing that I'm trying to find my way into. And that's cable access television, which I understand <laughs> well, is you're the most there. You are I am. so there. I am. Oh, you are. Well, then I can, awesome. I can check this one off the bucket list. Yeah, well, it entertains me that you're making up things about the media versus we believe that the media is just often making things up on their own anyway. <laughs> so, and you're working at that. Well, we don't. I've always, you know, when I school young journalists sometimes, which thankfully rarely happens because I'm the last person to give advice, I always tell them, when you're interviewing somebody and you're taking notes, getting those quotes, try to get them to say what you want them to say so you don't have to make it up later. 
<laughs> and they look at me like I've actually given them. The, I've just told them the worst thing they can possibly do. But, but no, we don't mix stuff up. And uh, at the newspaper I work, it's full of people who are very, very keen on getting it right because there's no real career advancement in screwing the pooch every time you go out there and getting it wrong for obvious reasons. So the idea of media bias, <clears throat> which is the subject of a speech I'm going to give later tonight, uh, is it's not that they go out there and say, how can we please Lenin today? It just it doesn't work like that. It's more a question of living inside a particular ideological bubble where you've right. existed since college and you've never really questioned what you've done. Unlike, of course, brilliant people like me who threw all that away. You know, they still have the same mental furniture and as such don't understand the arguments um, of the right because they don't listen to them. They don't listen to talk radio. They don't read right-leaning right blogs. So what the right thinks and why they think it is terra incognita. Uh, to a lot of us who made that switch, you know, I was in debate in high school, which is a great thing to do. It trained lawyers really well, believe me, because you learn how to speak with utter conviction on both sides of the issues. Absolutely. So it sort of is teaching sociopathy to high school students, which is just great. But you would get up there and you'd argue for the 55 mile an hour speed limit vehemently. And then you'd go to the next tournament and you'd argue passionately against the very same thing. But it helped to be able to understand intellectually. I, there's, there's the Fitzgerald quote that the, 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 the testament to a first-rate intellect is the ability to simultaneously hold two ideas at the same time. And that's always touted as a particularly brilliant insight. And I, to, to me, it's kind of obvious. That that's what you ought to be able to do. Otherwise, you have no idea what you're arguing about. So you have a lot of people who just have believed this way as the way that smart people naturally, sensibly think. And uh, as such, that's where the bias creeps in. How they select a story, sometimes what elements that they may push, not because they're trying to say, we got to get out there and just jam leftism down their throat with a toilet plunger today. It, it's not that, it's not that well, obvious. They don't recognize what is quote unquote leftism versus right wing politics versus mm -hmm. anything else because there's no spectrum that they've really even analyzed. They've only been fed one way. So if anything even comes across as neutral, it must be Far to the right. Well, they have a spectrum. They do, in as much as they will have, uh, they'll be Clint they'll be Hillary Clinton people, and they'll realize that Bernie's over here, or actually over here, camera left. Um, so they realize that on their own ideological set, there is a spectrum, but that pretty much defines the universe. There's, you right. know, it ends at Pluto. Um, so there's that. But um, yeah, the way that the right thinks is just not really. It's. It's a strange mix of weird people who show up at conventions with straw hats and 47 buttons on their suspenders, which is kind of the caricature that they have of them, or it's these, these arid, dry intellectuals with no compassion. You know, they look at Charles Krauthammer, and they look at George F. Will, and they look at William F. Buckley, and they see people who don't bleed sufficiently for the, you know, for the, for the, for the poor. There's, there's a line that a lot of journalists will quote, which is, um, well, I'm here to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And it's a great line, and you want to say, okay, well, you know, about that whole comforting the afflicted part, let's look at the end result of your policies. How's that worked out in the cities where you guys have been running things for 40 years? More aren't afflicted. You, aren't you kind of afflicting the afflicted at this point? But also you have to realize that the whole Comfort, afflicting the comfortable, which one guy described to me, he says, well, I'm just, I'm the kind of guy who likes to throw snowballs at the top hats, you know? Okay, now, if we're living somewhere where people are huddled in cold tenements, 40 to a room, and out in the streets of New York, the, the members of the Copper Trust are walking around caning orphans out of their way, that's the comfortable that you're talking about here. But in modern America, the comfortable generally can be somebody who's built a business, who's provided for himself and his family, and provided jobs to the community and pays an awful lot of taxes. He's the guy you gotta, you gotta afflict, really? Um, and the afflicted have big screen TVs and Cadillacs and everything else. So, like, Well, <laughs> precisely. And oftentimes the people who are doing the afflicted themselves, journalists, are not exactly amongst the poor, starving, huddled masses themselves. No. Uh, so, you know, if you're a journalist in a good paper with a union, you have uh, a spouse who works in law or in lobbying or something like that, in particular in Washington. <laughs> in Washington, when I was a journalist there, it was, it was the law that if you were in journalism, your spouse had to be a lobbyist or a lawyer, I swear. And if it was the other way around, you would go to, it's one of the reasons I left D.C., it had this monoculture. Everything was feeding Trantor, Coruscant, the beast, the empire. And you would go to a party and you'd say, what do you do? Say, well, I'm a, lobby for the, I'm a lobbyist for the chlorine industry. Say, hmm. So how's, 
how's, how's chlorine's legislative profile these days? You know, no, it's, it's good. We got some action on the Hill. It's fine. And, you know, and that would be it. Everybody was involved in somehow stroking the tentacles or, or working the suckers of the big federal octopus. And that was it. And that, that little community itself was nestled in a city that was tearing itself apart with poverty and violence, yes. from which most people were isolated, unless they lived, unless they lived in one of those neighborhoods. It was changing. My neighborhood at the time was changing, and you'd, you'd have people over to a party, and you'd say, you know, when you're going to get back to take the taxi cab, that block's bad, that one's okay. I would go around to that block, and they would look at you like, why can't you just paint red lines around here so the people going to these changing neighborhoods know where to go? So it was a combination of being bored by the culture and feeling not exactly safe, because my neighborhood went up in riots after two weeks after I got in D.C., and there are you know, police helicopters interrogating the inside of my apartment. I've never felt so defenseless, by the way, as when your, your neighborhood is going up in riots and the only offensive weapons that you have to, to defend yourself are a corkscrew you know, and a copy of a Madonna sex book or something like that. And, <laughs> and so nothing about it was safe for fun. And eventually I wanted to go back to liberal Minneapolis, which is, like most liberal cities, an absolutely wonderful place to live. For a while. For a while, but you know, we keep saying that. At some point, it's going to crack. At some point, it's all going to fall apart on them. Um, you know, our city is, bur is, is booming. We've got, our newspaper's booming. I work for a newspaper that is not dying. When people say, what's it like? We're not dying. It's an amazing thing. We that is amazing because the trend is Death. being so Death. sold to not-for-profits like they weren't before. <laughs> They're always right. Or to mysterious uh, reclusive billionaires who do things with them. We got sold to a local businessman who regarded his stewardship of the paper as something of a civic obligation. It's quite amazing. And he wasn't, and he's, he's brooded about as being something of a conservative as well. He said that when he was growing up as a small child in rural Minnesota, the paper would come a day or two late, and he would spread it out on the floor, and he would look at the news of the world, of Korea, and he would look at these stories of this city, and it was this whole world came to him through this window of the newspaper. Now, now of course, our little magical pocket computational device is you open it up and you're looking at smog in Beijing. But then, the print, the feel of it, the physicalness of it was something that really made an impression on him. And at the end of his, his, his uh, long business life, he bought us as this statement of faith and to make money, <clears throat> but he bought us. And so now we're... Media for money? Really? Media for money. We are hiring journalists. We are... Now you're um, talking crazy. I know. It, it sounds like madness. And let me tell you why this is so nuts. First of all, you can say, well, look at your demographics. They're old. They're educated. They got money. Yeah, okay, I'll take that. And it's possible that the industry will ride this particular demographic down into the crypt. I don't think so because there is something appealing about print that really something that, that, that other places don't have. There's a serendipity to the front page that you have when you see the arrangement of stories that you don't get when you go to a website. There's a portability to it. There's, there's just something about it that, that connects with some people. But even if we only go to the web, that's great. That's fine because we can do television. We can do all kinds of things that we couldn't do in print. So we're a media brand, and I, that's a loathsome term, but that's what we are. And I like that, and I like the fact that we're still, you know, that we're, we're, we're alive and we're prospering. Because what's the alternative? The thing that we do well is we do local news. We've got the largest newsroom in the state. Why would anybody want to go to us to read what the New York Times said yesterday? They wouldn't. So if you have a focus on local news, which is what the only thing that any local paper should ever do, is local news, that can't be spun. Somebody shoots somebody, it's hard to put a little spin on that. I mean, you can try. You can say, well, Michael Sanderson, alarmed by growing income inequality, stuck up somebody with a gun, underscoring the nation's need for a conversation about gun violence. I mean, you can spin it like that, but that's bad. Crime, who shot who, who took what bribe, what's being built, the who, the what, the where, the when, you know, save the why for later. These are the things that people like to know that only a local newspaper can provide. So we did that, and that's what the people seem to be wanting, and they pay us money for it. Uh, that's, uh, it's an amazing story. It's just not happening here in the Bay Area, and there's so much lean to the stories and everything else. Oh, I think it's because of the tech. You, you've got so many people in tech. They feel that if they were looking at a newspaper, it would be the equivalent of getting their news by a Morse lamp. You know, like somebody going yeah. on and off. Smoke, and signals, on. Smoke signals. Smoke signals. Whatever it takes. Carrier pigeons, passenger pigeons. But they got to, you know, again, it depends on the culture. Here I can understand why in, 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 in a diffuse and geographically large sprawling area like this, a local paper doesn't mean like what it does in Minneapolis. Minneapolis is a million and a half, million two people in the metro area, but it's a concentrated, fairly homogenous in its own uh, uh, culture sort of way. 
Um, and so a local paper is going to work there. How neutral is the news reported there? Uh, just looking for examples for others to copy, is it neutral? Does it lean one direction or another? Can you tell? <laughs> well, there are people who are always going to say that it's um, not neutral at all because... Um, it's owned by corporations. Corporations, are, they, they just want to make money. Right. And those are the people who are unhappy that your front page does not resemble the editorial section of the nation. You know, to them, the, me the media is biased to the right. And there will be people on the, on the right who will say it's biased because, as we mentioned before, the way it's phrased, story selection, stuff like that. It doesn't necessarily mean that a bias is being attempted. It just means that's sort of the way it's worked out with the composition of the people that they have. And sometimes I look at stories and I get bent out of shape. Because, you know, I know that's, that shouldn't, that, eh, and you get tired of it. You're right. tired of constantly picking through the entrails of everything, looking for bias. Right. And I'm sure that there are things that I would have written differently than other reporters. Um, I'm sure there are some reporters in the paper I know who are very liberal. Um, and there are some, you know, you never know. You have that little private conversation sometimes. <laughs> the code wink. The code, the code wink. Um, but I would say on, on whole, if you wanted to know what our city was about, the worst, the best, to pick up the copy of the Star Tribune, you'd have a fair and balanced look at what our community was. So outside of that microcosm, we Because I know this is going on, t I mean, because this is going on YouTube, right? Yeah. I, I'm not going to, what, what do you think I'm going to say? <laughs> the truth, man, the truth. That is the truth. Uh, just out of curiosity, sure. outside of that microcosm, is there any other place? We talked a little bit before the show that there are circumstances where even out in the wild, there can be civil conversations. On the, on the internet? On the internet, Oh, even. it's impossible. Can't be done. On our newspaper sometimes, you can always tell when it's a really contentious topic because there just won't be comments. Because we know that if we open it up to comments, oh, Nelly by the door, here they come. And you just don't want to get that because it looks really bad to have these raving lunatics in your comment section saying the worst possible things, which is like YouTube. YouTube is just like this, this, this uh, agglomeration of idiocy and illiteracy that's just as stunning. It's, what did these people do before they were YouTube? Did they stand outside of movie theaters and just mutter obscenities to people who walk by? Did they scrawl incoherent babble on postcards and stick them in the mailbox without addresses? What do they do? A site that I write for called, and do a podcast for, is called Ricochet, ricochet.com. And it's center right, and their novel idea is you have to pay to comment. How about that? You can read for free, but if you want to join the conversation, you have to actually pay, which means... You're literally putting your two cents in. You're putting your two cents in. You've got skin in the game, as Rob Long says. Rob Long is one of the, uh, the former Cheers writers, head writers, who's, uh, who's one of the founders of the site, with Peter Robinson, who's one of Ronald Reagan's speech writers. And Peter Robinson gave us the Mr. Gorbachev teared down this wall quote. So these are the two guys, smart, funny guys, who said, we got to have a place where we can have a conversation without people strangling each other and calling each other names. And so Ricochet was born, and for a modest you know, amount of money, you get to have skin in the game, as Rob said, two cents, as you put it. And it's a great conversation with friends. Yeah, I mean, elbows are thrown. But it's like we find, when you talk to people, you can usually find that common ground. And once you do and respect each other's humanity, you realize it doesn't have to be going at each other's throats like this all the time. So there, you're almost giving hope for humanity at this point. I have to, because otherwise I would just go back and make a dotted line on my wrist and say America's done. It's not. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's the, the American enterprise. The project still continues. And if we're just a little bit better to each other on both sides and uh, the media tries to be a little bit more to the other side. You know, it, we've got a, a good run yet ahead of us. So tell us where people can find out more information if they'd like to do a background check on you or find out where you're <laughs> writing such as that. Well, any number of those criminal <laughs> check your background warrants open sites, I suppose we'll do. Lilacs.com, L-I-L-E-K-S, is where I write Monday through Friday. I do a long thing called The Bleat, which is about popular culture, going to Target, about uh, movies, old radio shows, Google views of small towns. It's just, it's everything, and you can get lost there. Uh, that's where I do most of my work. StarTribune.com is where you can find my, my, uh, my local columns, which are, which are generally meant for a national audience. It's sometimes I'll write about Minnesota. So my architecture criti criticism is as well. And Ricochet.com. NationalReview.com I write for there as well. And the, in the print magazine, which again is still beloved by many, you can carry it around. You can, it's portable. It's, it's, you can save them up for the future. And uh, that pretty much covers it. Um, right. Although probably by tomorrow I'll have somebody else I'm writing for, and I'll just write you back, and you can like scrawl. We'll and just marker. add it in and marker. Yeah, or something. Right. You can just move your lips and and and, uh, and and add it in. Well, thank you for sharing a little bit about the things you do, the places you're involved in changing the world. And if you'll hold on for just a moment, we'll be back after a word from our underwriters, the Conservative Forum.
The conservative forum of Silicon Valley began with 20 conservatives meeting at a restaurant in November of 2003. Our mission is to promote the principles of American liberty through education. By 2012, we had grown to over 600 paid members. Our monthly meetings feature well-known and prestigious conservative speakers addressing issues that are critical to our country's very survival. This includes speakers like Victor Davis Hanson, Andrew Breitbart, David Horowitz, and many others. In addition to our monthly meetings, we sponsor a conservative local cable access TV show, The Right Side, covering today's topics. Our Constitution Discussion Group not only teaches the Constitution, but started our annual essay contest that awards two $1,000 scholarships to local high school seniors. We are a virtual clearinghouse for grassroots organizations by providing them with table space at no charge in our exhibit area. There are typically a dozen groups represented. If you are like-minded, join us at our next meeting and become motivated and empowered. Liberty made in America. And welcome back to The Right Side. That was a word from our underwriters, the Conservative Forum. We appreciate them immensely because they are now helping to underwrite the fifth season for the show. And without them, it wouldn't be possible. But the reality is we're not what they're best known for. Actually, their speaker series is what they're best known for. And that's why we were able to have James in the studio with us this evening. He'll be the speaker this evening at 7 p.m. at the IFES Portuguese Hall right here in Mountain View, California, about three minutes here from the studio. And in February, Jay Nordlinger, senior editor of National Review and the music critic of the new Criterion will be on. He writes on a wide range of topics from human rights to presidential elections to ballet to golf. In March, Kevin D. Williamson, roving correspondent for National Review and the author of several books. He covers the intersection of economics, public policy, and culture. And in April, John Eastman, faculty member of the Chapman University Law School since 1999, specializing in constitutional law, legal history, and property. He serves as the chairman of the board of the National Organization for Marriage and is the chairman of the Federalist Society's Federalism and Separation of Powers Practice Group. Prior to joining that, he was faculty uh, as a law clerk to the Honorable Clarence Thomas. We thank you for joining us this evening. We do encourage you to go to James' site, lilex.com, L-I-L-E-K-S.com. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in person or on the show sometime soon. If you just can't wait, though, reach out to us at therightsidetv at gmail.com, and we'll get back to you as quickly as possible. Thanks for joining us, and have a great night.